And now we turn our attention to my very special segment. And this is that Android journey story that I so much love. And you guys, we encourage you to always come on or pre-record if you wanted to your Android journey stories and send it to us. And we're so thankful today that Rod actually agreed to come on and talk about his Android journey story. We know those stories sometimes are nice. Sometimes they have rough endings or rough beginnings, I should say, uh, to them. And But then through... But then one goes through all that rough and tumble, and then by the time you know it, you are loving your Android journey. <laughs> so, uh, Ron, welcome again, and uh, we'll turn over the mic to you and help you talk to us about your Android journey story when you started, um, what difficulties you encountered uh, during this journey, and things like that, and how you got to know about some of the blind Android communities out there and have become part of us. Okay, well, I was first introduced to Android when I met Lou Lasher at an international ski event in 2016 in Michigan. For those of you who um, do not know about Ski for Light, it is a way for mobility impaired and visually impaired skiers to do cross-country skiing with the assistance of a guide. It's a week of skiing and socializing. There are a lot of motivated people at those events. Lou was telling me over lunch about a free app that he had written, which provided walking navigation. It was called Get There. And as a side note, without going into much detail because I am not that familiar with the detail, the app is now located at Lou Lasher Dot com if you wish to download the latest version of the Get There app. He was telling me how you don't even need to have cell service to use this app. Prior to that, I think I was using something called the Trucker Breeze. And when um, you started out walking, you weren't sure if you were going to get a satellite connection or not. It seemed to depend on whether or not the day was cloudy and other factors. But with the cell phone, the Android phone, you could count on a connection right away or soon after you started the uh, app up. A couple days later, after Lou had told me about that, my partner Don and I went outside with Lou on a cold afternoon to check it out. And I would say the highlight uh, was that at one point, the app pointed out a street that Don and Lou had to look for as it wasn't apparent to them. I think it was like a block away from where we were standing. And, uh, oh, oh, wow, there you there, get there, found this street. I think it was like Ohio Street or something like that. So I went home and I purchased the $30 LG phone that Lou was talking about. And after six months, I gave it to my brother. My brother Jerry is also blind and he, um, so he was using that app for a while. And I bought a Moto E, which I still have today. I think it was probably in the same price range. And um, unfortunately, between Motorola and Google, they are slowing the phone down to a state of unusable. I really like that phone uh, for use with Get There as it was small and it had an adequate volume. It was also a phone that I used for quite a while to assist me with indoor cycling and running. But again, the app developers seem to have a way of destroying accessibility on some of those apps. And, and now I'm not really able to use that phone for that purpose anymore. In the fall of 2016, I decided to purchase uh, uh, an Android phone with cell service. So I made them, but unfortunately I made the mistake of purchasing a Moto Z phone. The support from Verizon and Motorola wasn't very good. In the end, the phone was only upgraded to 8.0. I never was offered the option to go to 8.1. What was really helpful to me was the eyes free mailing list. That's what it was called, right? And uh, um, that was where I saw a lot of posts from Warren and Austin, I think was on there. 
and many others. It was a very high traffic list, but it was also very helpful. And I had Anna Garza's book on, on Android. It seemed at that point that there was so many things to learn and then apps would change. Um, so it felt like you were always uh, trying to just keep your head above water. Uh, but eventually, I found it um, the phone to to be comfortable to use for various applications. But I, I had problems with the Android phone itself, for example, making simple phone calls. Right now, I really don't remember what they were, except that sometimes talkback would scream in your ear when you were holding the phone to your ear. And um, so after a while, I, after my two-year contract was up, I decided I needed to really switch over to iOS. Don had iOS, and although I had some reluctance to do so, I switched over. And um, while Apple is the... Um, iOS is anything but perfect. It, uh, I, I felt I needed to do that weighing all the, the pros and cons. I still like my Moto Z phone for, for other things, with, even without cell service. You never know when you might find a visually impaired person that could use help with Android. So I think it's it's good to know. And at some point, perhaps, uh, there will be an opportunity which will cause me to decide if I you know, really do need to get, for example, the Android phone and the watch. It depends if there's an application in there that I would really like to use. It's really interesting, uh, Rod, that you talked about that. I'm talking about that LG phone you're talking about, the $30 uh, phone. I remember uh, Lou talking about that phone on the mailing list uh, back during the ice free uh, days. And of course, I had also gone out and gotten one. I think mine was $19.99. It was called the Sunrise, uh, LG Sunrise, very little uh, compact phone. And, you know, amazingly, actually, it had TalkBack running on it. And I... <laughs> <laughs> I turned that thing on and it worked. So I gave it to my kid. My kid was very young at the time and it was a perfect phone. Um, but it's interesting that you were actually able to run the GPS app on it and actually that you liked it. This is one of those uh, things in Android that we really like because it just uh, cuts through the whole price points, whether you want a flagship device, uh, mid-ranger or below mid-ranger um, phone and things like that, you can find it all uh, strewn across the Android landscape. And so that's one of the things that I like about it. And so when I hear stories like yours, uh, where, you know, there's this type of uh, experiments or whatever that, you know, people have this type of uh, phones and all of that, and yet be able to use it. I think it just goes to prove that point that Android is that versatile. Yes, it is. It is amazing. I just was wish it wasn't so hard to keep up on all the changes and talk back. And on the Apple side, uh, it seems like we're always trying to just uh, stay ahead. But um, I am interested in in um, updating my Android skills again. And I think someday I would probably buy a Samsung phone. I like the idea of having Ant Plus on the Samsung phones because when we go cycling, we can uh, use our bike sensors and 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 um, if we need to, we can share the sensor with Ant Plus that you can't do with Bluetooth. And also the idea of if I could find a watch to wear with my phone and find an app that would um, give me progress reports uh, while I'm on my treadmill. That would be awfully nice also. And that's where those wearables come in. And also, you know, this is something that one could also just simply use their phone if you wanted to. Uh, and just using that Google Fit and having a headset on, you could get those updates, uh, progress updates on your phone if you don't have a watch or whatever. So it's really nice that, to see that we, you know, we've gotten into this territory where we could have all of these things accessible to us. 
because the word here is that accessibility. I want to be able to uh, know what is going on as a blind person. Um, I don't want to ask someone to tell me what's going on. You know, how many steps have I taken? And the good news is that, you know, these things are accessible to us. And whether one has a watch or not, one could simply use his or her phone and just utilize that Google Fit. And it, it works very well, you know, for a while. Uh, I'm not into that kind of stuff, but now and then I try it for giggles and I noticed that it works well. I guess I will have to look a little more into Google Fit. I am not familiar with that app. Yeah, definitely Google Fit is an app to look into because it makes it easy and like I said, it's very accessible. And I'm not sure, but I think that our own Anna, um, the one you bought the book from, uh, did a demonstration. Well, I think it was Austin, actually. Austin, didn't you do something about Google Fit when we were doing some fitness uh, stuff uh, last year? I think it was episode... Yeah, I did. I did, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's just one of those things that uh, it's actually it's right there. And a lot of times people are not aware of those things. And uh, in reality, it's just right there. One of the uh, frustrations I have is when I see an inaccessible app. And I try to gather a few suggestions for types of code that might help. They were given to me by Lou. And I, I send them in and I'm thinking, is it really that hard to add these few lines of code? And yet it is very difficult, it seems, to get developers to even acknowledge the problem. And that was one of the nice things about the amazing slowdown or that Rolf was willing to actually fix the icons, uh, labels on the icons that were missing. And then he was willing to learn about implementing the use of an external keyboard. It, it is really hard to find developers that want to do that. It is really nice knowing, though, that this app, you know, the amazing slow downer uh, supports uh, keyboard navigation because sliders can be a little bit finicky, can't they? You know, they can be very finicky. And when you have the ability to use your keyboard to, you know, do things precisely, I think that gives that app a plus in my world because it makes it very important then and absolutely accessible. And when you find developers that are willing to go the extra mile, I think those people are worth the support of their app. And a lot of developers don't understand, you know, the subject of the accessibility. And sometimes if we need to just gently tell them, hey, you know, here are resources here you could find about this accessibility, or here are pages that will help you with that. I think they would be, most of them would be willing to do it, but some of them would say, oh, it takes too much time. But in reality, these things don't take all that time that a lot of uh, developers would like us to believe it does. Perhaps because of my age, I really like using apps that have keyboard access to them. I think it's fun to tab around. I'm not swiping. I feel more relaxed holding my keyboard. I don't have to worry about inadvertently dropping a finger and changing the focus. It really makes sense to have an app that supports that keyboard navigation, uh, most especially if we're talking about apps like this one, for example, that musical app that we just talked about, the Amazing Slow Downer. Frankly, it, it would make sense that this type of an app should have that keyboard support because then you have that fine control of the app and control it the way that you would like to have access to it. So I don't, I don't blame you for liking that. And, uh, uh, I think that it just adds more productivity to it. You know, things that you can quickly, because if you're using a keyboard command, you can quickly jump to a place that you want to. You, just like those of us who are blind, you know, when we're using our internet, using our screen reader on the internet, we, you know, utilize those, you know, keyboard commands. And it would be nice to have apps that support those type of things uh, and fully support keyboard but I think the problem that we have is a lot of people or developers are not familiar with these things or choose altogether to ignore things having to do uh, with keyboard. And it's sometimes a little bit of an arm twisting to get people to get to doing things like that. 
you know, if I think of a sighted person, how they might use their phone, I'm thinking for most sighted people, the last thing is that they would think you need a keyboard to go with this phone when you can quickly touch and do whatever you need to do. They don't realize how things take us a slightly um, take us slightly bit more time to do what it is we want to do. Exactly, and and that all makes sense. Well, thank you so much, Art, for that wonderful Android journey story. And um, I am looking forward to you, you know, trying another Android phone. Um, the Z uh, is a, was a good phone, and it's still a good phone. Uh, however, the problem that we have with Motorola phones is that Moto doesn't give them any life unless one goes by the uh, modding uh, using a custom ROM, and which is not uh, something that any person can do. Uh, it's only to the enthusiasts who know how to do those. But so in reality, I think you, you're looking at Samsung. Samsung is a good one to have because Samsung, actually, they're now the king of updates. And so uh, even surpassing Google in that department because some of the Samsung phones, including even mid-rangers, now have up to four years of OS support compared to the three-year or a support of the flagship phones from uh, Google. So uh, I think you wouldn't be wrong to, you know, down the line, you know, try uh, a Samsung phone for a change and see how that compares to uh, your Motorola support. Yes, well, my Motorola is uh, pretty slow. My biggest issue probably would be, oh, I got these two phones, but I really don't want two phone lines. But anyway, should I still spend the money? And so I'm guessing someday, maybe in a year or two at the outside, I'll end up buying a, a second, you know, a Samsung phone, which would mean I'd have a nice iPhone and a nice Samsung phone. I guess that's what technology is all about. It's the only way to learn how this technology works. Exactly.